In this video, we are going to go in depth about ordinal regression, look at it mathematically, get intuition for it, see how to put it in GLM form, and also see how to use it in R. As mentioned in my previous videos, there are two types of multinomial regression. In the last video, we saw how to deal with nominal response data, where there is no natural order to the different categories. In this video, we are going to focus on ordinal data, where the categories do have a natural order to them. The way to model this is by using the cumulative link model. The cumulative model uses the CDF, the cumulative distribution function, of the categorical distribution. For example, for j equal between 1 and c, we need c minus 1 cumulative functions. The first one will be equal to pi 1, the second to pi 1 plus pi 2, etc., up until c minus 1. Note that we don't need the CDF at c because that would be equal to 1. We can use different link functions to relate the cumulative distribution to the linear predictor. The popular one is the logit of the cumulative probability. This model is also known as the proportional odds ordinal logistic regression, or POLR. We relate the logit of the CDF to the linear predictor. Again, we are using the logit as a way to remove the constraints of the probability. A probability is constrained between 0 and 1, but the log odds of it is expanded to the whole real line. Note that in this case, having different slopes doesn't always make sense. So usually we use the same slopes, but have increasing intercepts. The model looks like this. And we can write this in matrix form like this. For notation ease, let's call this whole thing x times beta. Let's try to get some intuition for this model. Suppose we have three classes. That means we are modeling two cumulative probabilities. And so we have the following structure. Logit of p y less equal to 1 is equal to alpha 1 plus beta x. And logit of p y less equal than 2 is alpha 2 plus beta x. We assume alpha 1 is smaller than alpha 2. In the graph, you can see the two linear predictor lines. When x is below this line here, we have that the first logit is above 0. And this means that the most probable option is 1. When x is above this line here, we have that the second logit is below 0, and so we get that the most probable option is 3, since if the chance to be either 1 or 2 is below 0 0.5, the only remaining option must be above 0 0.5. But in between, it is not clear what is the most probable option, and it depends on how much gap there is between the lines. After taking the inverse logit, that is the sigmoid function, over the linear predictor, we get the following graphs for the actual predicted class probabilities. We see that the crossing with the line y equals 0 is translated to y equals 0 0.5 here after the sigmoid. Now let's try to understand why different slopes might not make sense. Suppose we have this kind of a structure where the first slope is positive and the second is negative. Let's see why this model doesn't make sense. After taking the sigmoid we get this. And notice that the left part might make sense but the right part doesn't. We have that the CDF at 1 is almost 1, but the CDF at 2 is almost 0. It can't be that the probability of y being less than or equal to 1 is very high, and the probability of it being less than or equal to 2, which is an event that includes the previous event, being lower. That is, we can't have the blue line being smaller than the green line. This is why we usually restrict ourselves to models with the same slope and increasing intercepts, which avoids this problem. Turns out this is also a multivariate GLM and can be put in EDM form. The only thing we need to modify is the link function. For example, for categorical, here is the EDM form where theta, the natural parameter, is the same. The link function is now the logit of the cumulative probabilities. We can get that by multiplying the vector of probabilities by the lower triangular matrix H as shown here. If we invert the link function, we get that the vector of probabilities is equal to h inverse times the sigmoid, inverse logit. h inverse is equal to a matrix with 1 in the diagonal and minus 1 in the first element left of the diagonal. The GLM derivative is thus equal to what we've seen before, here for a single observation. We just need to find the derivative of the inverse link function. Note that these are the dimensions of each element here. 1 times c minus 1 for the y minus pi, c minus 1 times c minus 1 for the inverse v matrix, the same for the derivative of the inverse link function, and finally for the x, it's c minus 1 times c minus 1 intercepts plus p for the covariates. The derivative is given here. Since we take the derivative of a vector by a vector, we get a matrix. But in our case, it's diagonal. 
So, putting it all together, we get this. There's another approach to handle the whole thing, and that is to assume that there's some latent variable, y star, which determines the value of y. If y star is below alpha 1, then y is equal to 1. If it's between alpha 1 and alpha 2, then y is equal to 2. If it's above alpha 2, we get 3. The choice of the random component, epsilon, determines the link function we are going to use. If we choose epsilon to distribute standard logistic, we'll get the logit. If we choose standard normal, we'll get the probit. But we can also choose any other distribution, and the link function will then be the inverse of that distribution CDF, or the quantile function of that distribution. Let's see this. We have that y star is equal to this. So the probability that y is less or equal to j is equal to the probability that y star is less or equal to alpha j, which is equal to this thing. And if we isolate the random component, it's equal to this thing. A word of caution here. Because of this minus over here, some code implementations report beta, and some already report minus beta. So that's something we need to watch out for. In any case, if epsilon is standard logistic, the last term is equal to the sigmoid, which is the CDF of the logistic distribution. And then inverting the sigmoid, we get the link function. If epsilon is standard normal, this is equal to the CDF of the standard normal. And then we can invert that using the probit and get the link function. For the probit link function, the previous analysis is changed only by the fact that now we need the derivative of the inverse CDF. Turns out this is equal to this thing over here. Again, this is the diagonal matrix. There's also another approach to look at the likelihood without the GLM analysis. For example, here for the categorical, we can replace each probability with the difference between the consecutive CDFs. Note that the first element in the product will only have p y less equal than j without the second term. And the last element will have 1 minus the CDF at c minus 1. We can replace the p with the CDF function of the alpha j minus x beta, we get this. Then if we take the derivatives, we get these expressions over here. Delta j k is equal to 1 when j is equal to k and 0 otherwise. Of course, we need to sum this over the i index for the full likelihood. The likelihood approach is actually equivalent to the GLM approach we've seen before. If you don't believe me, here I show it for the case of three categories and the logit link. You can pause the video on this slide and the next one and see they bring the same result. Here I'm using this new approach, and here I'm using the GLM approach from before. Notice that after all the hairy math, we arrive at the same thing. A question you might have is why bother do all this complex analysis? Why not just label the y values in increasing numbers and run a regular OLS regression? Well, while this approach is sometimes good enough, it suffers from some shortcomings. The first one is how do we even assign the numerical values? For example, in the case of the satisfaction survey, is giving one to five a good option? is the distance between very unsatisfied to unsatisfied is really the same as the difference between neutral and satisfied? The second problem is that, as we've seen in the latent variable analysis, there can be a range of y star values that correspond to a certain category. For example, we have all this range of y star for the value y equal 2. But if we use OLS, this range will be replaced with a single value. This tends to inflate the residual standard error and also affects the regression coefficients. Another con is that OLS doesn't give probabilities for the different classes. And another one is that the variance isn't constant. Assuming a latent variable model, there are low variance at the edge cases and higher variance in between. And another problem which relates to all of the above is ceiling and flooring effects. Here you can see an example from Agresti's book. On the left, you see the latent variable model for the two different values of a binary variable z. On the right, you can see an OLS fitted to the actual y's. Even though the real model is given here, the OLS fit shows that there might be an interaction involved between x and z, given by the fact that the two lines have different slopes, which is of course not true. Notice also that the variance around x equals 0 is quite low, but the variance in the middle for x equals 50 is quite high. Code-wise, there are several libraries that offer fitting cumulative link functions. We can use the VGLM function from the VGAM library and specify the family is cumulative and also the link. We need to specify parallel equals true if you want the same slopes. There are also the POLR function from the mass library 
and the CLM function from the ordinal library. And in Python, there's ordered model from the stats models library. Note that except for VGLM, which reports beta coming from alpha plus beta times x model, the rest of the implementations use alpha minus beta times x. Let's move to code to see it. We'll use the same data used by Agresti in his book. It is of mental impairment ranging from 1, which is well, to 4, which is impaired. There are two predictor variables. One is some life event index, and the other is a socioeconomic status as a binary variable. Here is the way to implement it with VGLM. VGLM requires the Y to be ordered, so we use as ordered. We see we get three intercepts, 4 minus 1, and they are in increasing order. Also, we get the two coefficients for the predictors. If we use the POLR function or the CLM functions, we have to set the Y to be a factor. Here are the results for each. We see that we get more or less the same intercepts, but that the betas switch signs. Again, this is because they model alpha minus beta x. Well, this is all for this video. See you in the next one.